know that employment is vital for people with criminal records to rebuild their lives and to be able to reintegrate into society. And one barrier to employment, but by no means the only one, is occupational licensing. In the last few decades, the number of occupations that now have licensure has really exploded. In the 1950s, it was 5% or so. And now we're looking at around 25% of occupations that essentially require a permission slip of sorts from the government in order to practice that job. Licensing creates high cost barriers for all individuals in society, but it has a particular difficult implication for those who have criminal records. And that's really what we're here to focus on today. So I'm thrilled to welcome you as we discuss occupational licensing, barriers more broadly that people with criminal records face, and why reforms are necessary. So I'd like to start by introducing the panelists. Um, to my direct left is Jennifer McDonald. Uh, she is a research analyst at the Institute for Justice, where she conducts original social science research as part of the strategic research team. Her research is featured in License to Work, a national study of burdens from occupational licensing. If you haven't seen the report, it's, it's amazing. I recommend you check it out. It goes through all the states and details the different licensing issues in each state. Prior to joining IJ, McDonald's worked in California politics. She holds a master's in public administration with emphasis on management and economic policy from the London School of Economics and Political Science, and a bachelor's degree in history with a political science minor from California State University of San And then next to my, sort of in the middle of the panel, is Marcus Bolanow. He's the founder and CEO of Flickshop, a mobile app that gives all incarcerated people the ability to get mail every single day from their loved ones. Flickshop has become a leader in the industry and has led Willow to co found the Flickshop School of Business, a program that teaches incarcerated men and women life skills and entrepreneurship. And finally, we have Professor Mark Howard. He is a professor of government and law at Georgetown University. He's also the founding director of the Prisons and Justice Initiative which brings together scholars, practitioners, and students to examine the problems of mass incarceration. He also teaches regularly at correctional institutions, including in the DC jails. His most recent book is Unusually Cruel, Prisons, Punishment, and the Real American Exceptionalism. Howard received his BA in Ethics, Politics, and Economics from Yale, his Master's and PhD in Political Science from the University of California, Berkeley, and his JD from Georgetown University. So, if you don't mind joining me in welcoming our panelists. So, I'm going to start with an introductory question for Jenny, right here to my left. Oh, there's mine. Uh, so, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about what is occupational licensing. Maybe not everyone knows, and then what are we talking about here today? Well, I think you introduced it really well by explaining it as a permission slip that people need from the government in order to work in their chosen occupation. Um, you know, these licensing laws now are an entry into hundreds of occupations across the country, um, particularly those that might be best suited to people of more suites. And this could be everything from barbers and cosmetologists to a wide variety of construction trades, uh, maintenance contractors, and that sort of thing. Um, our study, the system work that you mentioned, uh, did a, a nationwide survey of 102 lower income occupations to really kind of measure what those like, licensing burdens are and what they mean in different states. The national average that we found is that an occupational license takes about a year uh, in education and training to obtain um, passage of at least 20 years, and it will cost you about $260 in fees to get that license. And that's just the licensing fee. That doesn't account for whatever money you would pay for tuition or training programs, um, the lost wages while you spend your time in school, or even your business licensing fees, which I heard in DC can cost upwards of $700. Um, so this is really a very meaningful barrier, and, and particularly for people who have a criminal record who can often be denied an occupational license for all kinds of reasons that don't necessarily directly relate to the occupation that they want to work in. Um, we talked about the collateral consequences of licensing and license to work, and uh, we really just kind of measure how this whole thing has exploded over the last uh, several decades, um, and we make some pretty serious recommendations for reform uh, to put people back to work and improve. 
One of the things you mentioned is your report goes state by state. If I have a license in one state, does that mean that I'm now licensed to work in that profession in other states, or how does that work? Often it doesn't. Um, we see this problem all the time. Uh, we have a client at IJ right now who uh, was a dietitian in California, didn't get a license, was giving diet advice to, you know, without any bad consequences. Um, she moved to Florida when her husband was transferred with the military, and all of a sudden that same occupation, which was perfectly safe in California of all places, is now illegal in Florida. Um, so there's quite often no reciprocity across states, which is problematic. Um, but rather than arguing for reciprocity across states, we really argue that you just shouldn't have these licenses at all because the most rural license is one that just doesn't exist unless people work whenever and however they choose. Mark, I want to send it to you because I know a lot of your work is about broader collateral consequences and also contextualizing the situation in the U.S. with other countries. So occupational licensing is just one collateral consequence. What other issues have you seen in your experience individuals from reentering society uh, face, and, and how is it different in other countries? Sure. So uh, for those of you who just heard about this for the first time, you're probably thinking this is totally irrational. Right? Why does it make sense that somebody would be banned from a certain profession just because they have a criminal record that's so totally unrelated to you know, that line of work. And it is totally irrational. But what I'd like to share with you is that that's just one among many things that are totally irrational and that are, as I write in the book, unusually cruel about the way we do things in the US. Um, so when you realize, first of all, the vast number of people who are in American prisons and then who eventually come home, and 95% of people incarcerated do come home, I've been talking about numbers that are seven to ten times higher than any European or other advanced democracy. Right? So the numbers are just staggering. And then the limitations that are put on them, called collateral consequences, are just insane, right? to put it mildly. We have 6.1 million Americans who can't vote right? because they have a criminal conviction. That's one collateral consequence. Um, there are uh, effects in terms of housing. Many states still have a policy where you cannot live in public housing, including living with a relative, your mom, when you come home. If that person is in public housing, they will get evicted if you go live with them. There are all kinds of restrictions that are placed on people when they come home. Um, the biggest, though, is in terms of employment, and that's what is so difficult for people. There's this stigma already that's huge um, that makes it very hard to get hired. And ban the box legislation, as some of you may know, but it's good. It's better, but it still leads to the problem of, of discrimination against people with records because they find out about the second stage, right? maybe not the first stage. Um, but we make it in this country so difficult. We have this expression that you pay your debt to society, but when is that debt ever paid when you have these collateral consequences that follow you for the rest of your life? You asked about other countries. The U.S. is unique in the way we do things, right? and I don't mean that in a good way. Uh, in other countries, there are what's called privacy in European countries I'm talking about, where employers don't have a right to know about your criminal record unless it's directly relevant to the line of work for a job you're applying for. So if you're convicted of financial crimes, fraud, and that type of thing, well, an employer at a bank has a right to know about that record, right? If it's a crime that involves children, then you're applying for a job in school, obviously. And we can all think everyone's nodding because that makes sense, right? We don't want people who committed crime against children to be around children. We don't want people who committed financial crimes to be working with money. Right? We can understand that. But the way we do things here, unfortunately, is just irrational. And it's punitive, and it was set up in an era where nobody was really thinking. They were just saying, let's just be tough. Let's just sound tough. Let's be tougher than our opponent, right, as a part of the political campaign. And the result today is we have this, this absolute mess that's so hard to unhandle. But fortunately, we're having this conversation about occupational licensing, not just here uh, this evening, but also, I think, in this country, because more people are realizing it makes no sense. Can anyone defend, logically, rationally, these bans on people from working in certain areas that have absolutely no connection to the crime that they committed? And often, since our sentencing policies are insane in this country, where people get sentenced for much, much longer than they do in other countries, that happened so long ago. They're not even the same person that they once were, much less the type of crime that went to the line of work. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. 
Um, Marcus, in light of what I said, I wanted to turn to you. I know you work directly with individuals who are incarcerated, teaching them entrepreneurship, as well as in your business with Flipshop, you're working with incarcerated individuals and families. And I just want to know a little bit more about, from your experience, what barriers are people encountering, both the occupational licensing and more generally to getting employment? What is it like out there? Yeah, I mean, so, thank you. I love this echo. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you all for being a part of this, of this conversation. Uh, you know, I'll tell you firsthand, I mean, for, for years, one sits in a cell and they dream about the opportunity to be able to do something. Right? Most don't know what that something is until maybe the latter stage of I'm getting ready to come home or I'm home, I've been in the in, justice system involved, I want to be able to choose. I do something really, really well. And most of those, I do something really, really well, kind of sort of occupations. They're kind of governed by these licenses. Um, and what happens is you, you know, you go out and say, you know, I'm a barber, I cut really, really well. I've cut hair for five years straight. I mean, I know how to write your name in the back of your hair with clippers, right? I know how to do insane things with clippers. And then you go downtown to Fourth Street, or you go downtown, you know, you go to, to Baltimore to the Department of Assessment and Taxation, you start applying for some of these licenses. Then you know you won't get because you know that you don't want to go back to a life that won't have the same smile that you had when you walked into the assessment and taxation until you finally pay that $300 and you have to check that box and that green screen goes red. It changes everything. Your life completely changes. The moment that you don't understand, it's inconceivable. What, like, why are these rings just turn red? And why are you now telling me that I can't do the thing that I'm really massive for? It? I just can't do it because of, wait a minute, because I went to prison years ago? Because I've served my, you mean to tell me I can't cut hair? Because, or in my personal situation, you can't sell real estate because I stole a car from someone. It was really tough. It was tough for me personally, and I can talk about that, but for many of my students, it's a big, big, big barrier. Not even just for their occupation, the, the promise of success they have for their future, but even what that does for their psyche and then everyone that's connected to them, the belief system that they had before they came home and now they have now, and even the friends that come home behind me and say, You about to do what? Man, don't waste your time going out there because you, we can't do we can't do that. Horrible. So, the problem, one of the problems with occupational licensing is they're governed by licensing boards. And these licensing boards are set up by legislation that says, you know, this is a board that will govern this occupation and it has to be comprised of people who know how to practice this occupation. Does that make sense, right? The problem is that these people have a vested interest in this occupation, they have a vested interest in keeping competitors out of their industry so that they can raise their prices and make more money. So you have the people in charge of saying who gets a license and who doesn't, how much it costs to get a license, what those requirements are, with every ability to keep people out. Um, if too many people are coming in, they can say, you know, we're going to bump that minimum score on the exam up so that we can limit the number of people coming up. And there's virtually no legislative oversight that governs this type of behavior. Um, when it comes to criminal records, quite often states have these good moral character laws, which are basically just vague requirements that say, you know, the board is, can deny a license if it means the person to not be, you know, of upstanding character. But you don't know what that means. So the board can say, look, you've got a criminal record, we're going to say that you're not good enough. But like you mentioned, sometimes you don't find that out until after you've spent all of the time, all of the money to get this training, right? Um, and so these vague requirements just out for absolutely no reason if it's not related to their occupation. Um, so what we advocate for, uh, short of you know getting rid of these licenses to begin with, is if you're going to deny a license for somebody, uh, the crime has to be serious, uh, a serious felony. The crime has to be directly related to that occupation, and then also you have to prove that by granting this personal license, you're increasing the probability that they will reoffend. Um, so it takes it even one step further. Even if it is related, if it's not going to hurt anybody, if it's not going to make them more likely to reoffend, why are we denying them the ability to work? Um, and unfortunately, these boards just have they have every interest and every power to uh, deny these licenses and deny their competitors. Can you talk more about um, 
certain states that seem to be doing a better or worse job of this, and perhaps why, in terms of the law's wording, what wording seems to give occupational licensing boards the sort of license to deny people. Um, so Arizona actually is, is a pretty good example of somebody who does well in this area. Um, Arizona has basically that gym I just mentioned, where it's a serious crime related to the license um, that will increase the opportunity for reoffense. Um, so without that, Arizona prevents boards from denying people an occupational license just because of their criminal history, um, which is fantastic. And we're seeing more and more states kind of adopt some of these reforms. Um, quite often, they're fairly toothless, and they say, you know, well, you can't do it if it's vague, but it's a conviction that you don't like, you can go ahead and deny a license. Um, unfortunately, Arizona is also pretty bad on occupational licensing. It's one of the worst states in our study um, for licensing a lot of lower income occupations and doing so um, fairly burdensomely. So they're getting their own part of it, but mm -hmm. have a ways to go. Fair enough. Um, Mark, I wanted to come back to you and learn more about. Who's affected? Meaning, what kind of numbers are we talking about? Yeah, and you, you alluded to earlier that we have a huge problem in America. So I'd love to learn more about that. And um, also, the fact that we're not just talking about people that have convictions necessarily. My understanding is boards can look at arrest records too. Whatever comes up on a background check. Criminal character is pretty big. Right, right. And so, Let's swap the American population that we're talking about. How many people are affected by this? Yeah, no, that's an important question. I mean, I think some people, if you're hearing this for the first time, you might think this is really minor, tangential with just a few people. One out of four jobs require a license. Right? Twenty-five percent of jobs out there, people have to go through some kind of occupational license. So that means that people with a criminal record, such a vast number of them are just excluded from you know, I don't know exactly how the proportion of worked out in terms of the overall numbers beyond that, but you know, roughly 25% of people um, with criminal record cannot work. And it's in all kinds of things that are very, very common. I actually have this list here, I'll just read them out. It's, yeah. it's just so interesting because, again, think about it. The question we should always be asking, and this is, I think, the Venice criteria is it rational? Right? Because we can all think of certain examples where we would want somebody to commit a certain type of crime to be working. Right. But that tends to be very narrow when you hear the list that's very broad, right? So, barber, right? A very colorful example of that, that's a common one that's given. Electrician, uh, practical and vocational nurse, physical therapy assistant, real estate appraiser, teacher assistant, bus driver, EMT, and paramedic, manicures, and pedicures. You know, oh, heaven forbid someone touch my toes. I don't know who did drugs with this. Um, uh, pipe fitter, steam fitter, real estate sales agent, veterinary technician, bus driver, hairdresser, massage therapist, plumber, respiratory therapist, vocational educational teacher, general contractor, heating AC, refrigeration mechanic, nursing assistant, preschool teacher, security, firearm system installer, water treatment system operator, home inspector, heavy tractor, trailer, truck driver, occupational therapy assistant, private detective, security guard, dental hygienist, insurance sales agent, pharmacy technician, radiologist, technologist, Skin care specialist. I mean, it's just so vast. There's so many things, uh, so many people um, who could work in that area. Right? These are all sort of credible um, fields that people could see being employment, and they're just excluded from that for reasons that, again, with a few exceptions, just don't make any sense. Um, so a lot of people are affected, um, and this is a really a major issue that I think people need to pay more attention to. And this is not in any way a left-right issue. This is just a common sense issue. I, I don't think, I can think of ideological arguments why one side would support it, another side would oppose it. Everybody should be supporting this because this is about sort of common sense and basic human de decency in terms of the opportunities people get. And just common sense in terms of who we want to be filling the job. We want people who are smart, who are good, who are qualified, and who get selected by employers. All right, so why have this external, you know, criterion that came from another era Totally irrational error. Why should that be applicable today? I wanted to follow up because I think you're very involved in post secondary education in prisons. Mm -hmm. Is one of the issues uh, that you've seen or that concerns you that I think people are getting more on board with providing vocational training and educational training in prisons, but one of the concerns I have is I've seen programs that are training people to be welders or to HVAC and then 
not taking into consideration the licensing that they'll need later. And you know that they may not even be able to get it. And they've got all this training. Or in California, they have prisoners fighting fires, but they may never be able to be firefighters. Is that something that you've seen in your experience teaching at Jessup and DC? And yeah, no, absolutely. And first of all, I would say I've seen some incredible people behind bars who are so talented, so gifted, who made mistakes a long time ago, who want nothing better than to come out and to contribute positively to society. And we should be supporting them, right? And that's what I try to do in my efforts when I'm teaching um, in prisons, um, and also in terms of re-entry programs that we're starting in Georgetown, getting very active um, in this area. Uh, but this is something where uh, people uh, want to be growing and changing and transforming and being ready. I think that sometimes the prison authorities, where they have jobs in prison, there's a little bit of double speak because they like to say, oh, well, we're preparing people to work on the outside. And then we'll sort of not say, oh, that's a good thing. But then you see, well, what is it that they're doing? And sometimes they're doing things where they can't actually get hired outside. Now, maybe out of control. Sometimes they're saying, well, you know, the license plate that I had to go to the prison in Maryland where all license plates in the state of Maryland are made, and a lot of guys, my students in there, make all the license plates. So I think about every time I see a Maryland license plate, including on my own car. Um, but, you know, that's not a skill that's going to work outside. On the other hand, there's something about um, productivity and working in the you know, factory and punching the clock and checking in and doing a good job that's important. But with this is where some, some of the double speak is that a lot of the people who are working on this job are lifers who may never get out. Right? And so they say, well, we're, we're helping people prepare them with job skills. I don't think they always mean it. I think they're trying to get things made very cheaply because. People know how much um, somebody behind bars gets paid. You know, a minimum wage is outside, right? Some places it's even 15 an hour. Um, in prison, it's more like 15 cents an hour. Right? People get about a dollar, maybe two two dollars a day is a very high paying job in prison. Right? I know somebody who works in hospice. Right? That is the hardest work imaginable. Right? I mean, he's working with people who are in their last days who are dying, and he makes a dollar a day. Um, so, I don't think that, unfortunately, prison officials are always on board with this idea of helping people. There are a lot of organizations, um, whether it's universities or nonprofits, that are, I think, doing uh, an important job. But I think overall, as a society, we need to be really focusing on how do we help people prepare to be productive, successful citizens when they get out. Marcus, I wanted to turn to you. I uh, know you mentioned earlier you had a personal experience with occupational licensing in real estate. I was hoping you could share that story with us. Yeah, so, um, sure. <laughs> uh, the this story probably started at St. Bride's, Bride's Correctional Center um, when a friend of mine would, he would get the Virginia pilot, that's the newspaper in the Chesapeake, Virginia area, one of the facilities where I was. Um, in the Virginia pilot, in the business section, this is where they will list all of these properties that would come up for sale and a tax sale and something. It introduced me to something like, wait a minute, you can buy a house for how much? And so I started to read books on it, right? All of the textbook books from, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, all the way through how to buy a real estate and make a good sale and some dollars or something. Like that. No, I don't think so. Well, not no, I don't know. But a lot of these people read this book only because it's about this. I don't know because it's about um, but what what it did was it fostered something inside of me that's wrong with her, right? I knew that I was gonna come home, um, my mom is sitting right here in front, right? And I would promise my mother, right, you know, because I'm I, I went to prison when I was 15 years old. Uh and you know, I grew up in prison still. I spent eight years in a dark maximum security prison, right? 16th birthday, 17th birthday, 18th birthday, 19th birthday, 20th. And my mother had to go through that with me. And she would encourage me. Uh, and education is important, keep breathing, keep going, there's life after prison. And I knew that life after prison included doing something in the business world. And this was my first introduction to it, exposure is everything, right? There's zero issue introducing, there's very few opportunities to be introduced to these kinds of occupations um, outside of the service industries. Uh, but I knew I didn't want to do that, I wanted to do something different. First thing I saw, tax liens, I'm reading books on it. Come home, I 
you know what I mean? Uh, one of my one of my friends that grew up with now he's a developer, he's a real estate developer. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been reading books for I think gazillions of dollars on real estate. You should give me a job. And, and he's like, Marcus, you know, you're an awesome salesman, you're very fun, you're charismatic. Um, period. I am charismatic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you bring money, and I think this is going to be great for you. In fact, you have to have a broker that you know says that you're they're willing to accept you come into their firm as long as you get an A, as long as you get the agency license. You're going to have to go through this class, enroll in the class. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you with the class. I'm going to help you with the books. You know, the class is way in the long run. I know you're going to have to figure out a way to get there to the Laurel Community College campus. Figure it out. I don't know how you're going to do it, but if you're hungry, you want to do it. Get on buses at five o'clock in the morning. I'm taking this class at Laurel in the Laurel campus at Prince George Community College, um, Real Estate 101. I'm super hyped. Three months. I'm going to go get my license. It's going to be great. Every day, the first person in the class, you know, I'm with all the other guys who want to make this zillions of dollars. I'm like, yeah, we're going to make this money. We're closing escrow. I know, I know. <laughs> and you know, I mean, on a bus home, reading books. I'm really, really excited. And at the end of the class. Get the certificate. I passed the class. I know real estate. I knew real estate not when I was in prison reading books, bro. But now I officially know real estate. And now the, 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 the next step is to go to take the test for the real estate exam administered by a company called PSI. So go to the exam. You know, go take the oh, mom. Can you give me a ride? I want to go take the exam. You want to give me a ride? I want to catch the bus for longer. Want to sell real estate for me? The zillions of dollars. I've read books on how to do it. Want to be awesome. Mom drops me off. She, I go upstairs. And, you know, I'm taking this the, the real estate exam. You know, it's forty or so questions, and on the state side, and there's more questions on the the, the national side. And if you pass this many, this test that stops. You pass, you go home. I get all of them right. I don't even have to take half of the test. Mind blown. I'm like, oh, gazillions of dollars. Yeah, I know. <laughs> In fact, they print, they print the results right there until you take these results, mail them in to the Department of Assessment Taxation, oh, I'm sorry, the Department of Labor and License Regulation, the LLR in Maryland, you're going to be good to go. Forget that, let's say, where is it? Where can I drive it? I'm going to get this license today. Mark Sheffield, you know, I mail it, I mail it in, I do, you know, I can try it right now, the next day express, I'm paying extra 13 bucks, and just like, someone making 17 bucks. And I give the letter back. Thank you so much, you know, for applying for this. Unfortunately, and my heart drops. I just come home, I spent eight years in prison. I built my life, my, all of my future, my dreams, the family I'm gonna build, all of the things I promised my mom that I'm gonna do, off of the response of the letter that says she can't do any of those things. Start from scratch, start from square one. You'll be okay. I have to go back and go to the broker friend. I'm sorry. I know you paid for my class, I helped pay for my class. I mean, you know, you paid for my books, but I can't do this with you. I have to tell my mom, I have to go now and look for another job. I'm probably going to go in one of those industries that I didn't want to work in because I'm going to be able to help the children to home. This is the hardest moment. This is one of the hardest moments in my life because this one I had to realize that no longer. Was it just the time that I spent in prison that I had to be concerned about? This was this felony that lived on my chest that I'm gonna have to live with for the rest of my life, as long as we have these kinds of barriers that will prevent any possibility of a success path for almost 2.3 million people, that 95% of them will be returned by God in the It's crippling and today it has to stop. Marcus, I know, thank you so much for sharing your story, first of all. And I know you were resilient, and when you got that rejection, you went and you tried to find another opportunity. But I wanted to ask both Jen and Mark what the impacts of this kind of licensing regime can be. I know there are actually a lot of people might you know, assume, well, we want licensing, it protects public safety, but is that really the case? Does it improve public safety? Does it actually perhaps harm public safety? Is there any evidence to suggest that? Um, and when people are, you know, without employment, what other detrimental effects can result? Maybe we'll start with you, Jenny. Sure. Um, so there's 
very little if any evidence to suggest that a criminal history is associated with lower job performance. Uh, so there's no reason to think that just because somebody has this record that they're not going to cut your hair as well as you would like them to, or that sort of thing. But also have no evidence to suggest that licensing actually makes you a better worker, that you do a better job. Um, so this is purely about just kind of picking and choosing who gets to work and who doesn't get to work. Um, one of the big problems with this on the macro scale is that keeping people out of work can increase recidivism, right? One of the best ways to keep people from returning to prison is to make sure that they have a steady job, that they can um, support themselves, support their families, um, and move forward with their lives. Uh, Steve Salinsky at Arizona State University has done some really good work on this, um, actually used our to do it, um, and he found that over a 10 year period, uh, states with some of the more burdensome occupational licensing laws saw their recidivism rates jump by over 9%, whereas states with less burdensome laws saw their recidivism rates decrease by 2.5%. Um, so it's just, it's very clear that occupational licensing has a direct impact on uh, making sure that people aren't able to make it once they return home from jail or prison. All right, so you want to chime in? Sure, I mean, I completely agree with what Jenny said. Um, and I'll just add, I have nothing against the licensing per se. I mean, it's, in theory at least, it's a good way to just check that people have the skills and qualifications that are required for a certain job. I mean, would you want somebody doing the electrical work in your house who doesn't have those skills? So I think we would all say, no, it's good. We can say, okay, if it's a licensed electrician, we can be confident. What I'm against is just exclusions, right? Why do we exclude people from that based on a previous criminal record, particularly one that's unrelated to that line of work? I also have nothing against voting. I mean, voting's a great thing, but why do we exclude people from voting? 6.1 million people, right? 20% of African Americans in the state of Florida cannot vote for the rest of their lives the way Florida law works. Think about that, this is Florida. Um, I have nothing against housing, but why do we exclude people from qualification for housing, particularly public housing, if they have a drug addiction? Um, I have nothing against employment. On the contrary, we need more of it. Why do we exclude people? We're setting people up to fail, and then later when they do fail, and then recidivism rates are high, we say, oh, they're bad people. No, we're actually setting them up to fail. We're pushing them over the cliff in some cases. Right? And who are we helping? We're not helping ourselves. Right? I mean, prison is costly, it's incredibly wasteful. You know, if people go back into life of crime, that's costly. That's, you know, safety and victimization and so on. Who could ever be in favor of that? Right? So again, it's a question of just to be rational and think about what makes sense and why we have certain policies. So we need to really go back to the beginning in a way. But that's very hard to do politically, right? If you have these laws in place, you have very hard to disentangle. I mean, we're, we're talking billions of dollars every year that this cost the economy. Millions of workers were kept out of work and billions of dollars in lost productivity, lost wages, lost earnings. So it, it doesn't just impact um, returning citizens and their families and their communities, but literally everybody who participates in the economy is, is hurt when we don't allow everybody who wants to work to participate in their occupation that they're best suited to. Marcus, I know what you want to jump in. Yeah, I mean, because my question is always like, what is, what is the expectation? Right? What is the expectation? What was the expectation of me to come home? I mean, I can't go get a license to, I can't go sell a real estate, I can't cut hair, I can't cut your grass, I can't fix your wires in your home. There's so all of the things that I think about that I want to do as a, as a career choice. You're living, but you're saying, find out what else you can do outside of these exclusions and then build a life around that. Meanwhile, when you put on a job application, you're still played by the by the box, and in the event that we get rid of the box, cool things, we'll catch you when it's time for the interview when we can ask you the same question that we're on the box initially. But in the event that somehow you're able to get a job over there, when it comes to housing, you can't live in public housing with a family members who want to help support you because you probably come from him. A lot of us, I did, we would come from one of the, some of the best neighborhoods. I came, I mean, I was blessed that when I came home that my mom had to live like so, but if she did the children it or or if she, if she didn't own, instead of, she rented and the landlord had to. In fact, real story, I mean, we built a construction business that generated over $4 million in revenue, giving us enough money to be able to launch a tech company now that connects hundreds of thousands of families around the country. 
And when my wife got pregnant and we moved out of our condos, upgraded to a larger place, we didn't want to buy a home immediately, so we went to rent an apartment. Not even thinking about it. I've been home for 10 years at this moment. My wife, I have, I've had a time of my life and built the business. And it's been an incredible experience. But the moment I went there and I put in the application, no, you can't live here. This is a, this is a nice, very nice community, but Marcus, we've seen it about 25 years ago, you stole a car from somebody, so you, you can't live here. And I see you on see it. The lady told me, I see you on see it last night. <laughs> but yeah, I'm so sorry you can't live here. What is the expectation, right? So if you don't have the resiliency of a market, so it's, you know, a couple of others, you're probably going to recidivate. You're probably going to go back to what's familiar to you. You're probably going to go back to the communities, the people who do accept you and allow you to do the things that will allow you to take care of your family, that probably will put you back into a place where that circle continues to evolve. What is the expectation? Well, I wanted to shift to a more optimistic note. Perhaps we can talk about sleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reality. And now we get to hopefully dream a little bit and think about what, what, what could the country look like? Like, what solutions would help to, to solve the problem? And I want to start with you, Jenny, because I know you've done a lot of in depth looking at the different states' laws, looking at states that are doing a better job of modeling how occupational licensing could look and saying that they're not. So, what, what could states do at a policy level? What could licensing boards do? How could they possibly change the landscape? I mean, there's so much that needs to be done to be done. Um, and they all need to happen. It's, it's not just sort of one thing and it'll solve the other problems. But I think the big picture sort of perspective that we need to take is that it's a, it's a changing of the stigma. It's a humanizing of people, right? It's looking at people like Marcus and looking at him for who he is today, right? Not looking back at some old mugshot or some image or some stereotype. And I'll make a point that I made actually when I was on the panel with his uh, good friend and co friend, Wayne Betts, who's also amazing. And the two of them are just, their story is extraordinary, right? 
right? And if someone hasn't bought the movie right yet, uh, they will soon. Uh, but from what they went through, you know, at a young age and then in prison for so long, and both of them doing extraordinary things. And Wayne went through this, uh, another version of occupational licensing challenge when he was denied. He went to end up going to Yale Law School, passed the Connecticut Bar Exam, and was denied because of the character and fitness review, which they all know would be, you know, card as if that sort of like defines him somehow permanently. And eventually, thanks to many, many people and a lot of public outrage, that was the attorney he needs now to the bar. But um, it just shows you, you know, licensing is in so many different areas, including the legal profession, including going to Yale Law School, and that's not enough, right? Um, but, but what I wanted to say is that while Marcus and Dwayne are exceptional individuals, they're not really exceptional in the sense that there are literally hundreds of thousands of other talented young men and women like them who are locked behind bars who are not being given a chance. And when they do get out, we've set up a system that tries to trip them up at every twist and turn. And they perhaps jumped over those hurdles better than just about anyone could. But there's so many other people who deserve a genuine path to success without all these obstacles in the way. So occupational licensing is one, but there are just so many others that I think if we could just shift our mindset and treat people as human beings and actually help them, they want to succeed. People who are in prison, and I'm in there you know, regularly once or twice a week and have been for years, they, they, they don't want to go back out and they don't want to go hurt people, they don't want to go back selling drugs, they don't want to go back you know, addiction can be a little bit of a different thing, obviously, but they want to come out and they want to succeed and they want to pay their taxes and they want to buy a house. I mean, they want to do everything that everyone here wants to do, right? And why shouldn't they have that opportunity? So let's actually make pay your debt to society a real thing and then when you leave the doors, it's over and you have a real chance. Thank you for that. And Marcus, I wanted to leave it with you about what you think about the initiative, what's most powerful, and kind of the same question that I, I asked Mark. Yeah, you know, so I'm, I'm on the ground. I, I believe, you know, I can only go about what helped me, right? My, my mom and the connection to the family, to the community, um, that helped. I'm here to just to, just to humanize just that way, right? Like, um, I have incredible neighbors now, and some of them probably, if they knew my background, they would hate that I lived in the neighborhood where I live. Um, my reality, right? So how can I begin to change that narrative and so I walk around with this, instead of walking around with a big F on my chest that says selling, I walk with one that says flip shop, right? And, and so I, I do it intentionally because most people, they walk around, you know, they got crazy hair, you know what I mean? Clearly, I don't know what those barbers are doing. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I, I try to figure out ways to be able to keep the community connected to the population of the people that are going to be coming home. If I can figure out a way to use technology to, to, to keep the community connected and humanize the story and bring people in to where we are, then I think that it changes the conversation around the dinner table. When it changes the conversation around the dinner table, somehow, some way, it ends up down here in the halls of Capitol Hill and change begins to happen. And so we want to be able to figure out collectively how can we band together to be able to create real action items to create a sense of support hug, a big hug, a big loving warm. I'm here for you, we support you, we believe in you, because you're going to come home and succeed. And if, I think, if we can figure out a way to build the technologies to make that happen, then I think that we're moving the needle a little bit closer to maybe just some, you know, the, the support levels that allow for those to come home so that we won't be the anomalies. You'll say, you know what, I can help fight through this. There's a team of people who believe me, there's a community of people who say that this is wrong. Thank you for that. I wanted to turn it to the audience and see if we have any questions for our panelists. Yep. Hi. Um, this question is specifically for Mark Howard, but everybody's welcome to answer. Uh, it's about the ban the box policy image. Um, my name is James Criven. I'm a fellow Georgetown law grad, also focused in criminal justice issues. Uh, one thing that I found over the past year working on these issues is that the ban the box policy is actually fairly controversial. Um, Everyone I worked with supported occupational licensing reform, preventing government bodies 
from restricting who could get licenses, especially restricting people who had a criminal record of getting licenses. But stopping individual employers uh, from asking about that, banning the box in those applications, uh, some people said that that created more problems than it solved. Um, they pointed to these two studies uh, they compared in New York, New Jersey, and other states before and after these policies were implemented. Um, they said that afterwards they saw a lot more racial disparity in hiring. Uh, they were screening out people based on their zip codes. Uh, they were screening out black and Hispanic men without college degrees, and it created a lot of racial injustice. Um, how would you respond to the results of that studies, and what can be done from a policy perspective for, to sort of prevent these kind of results from happening? Sure. So I've read the studies. I've read the rebuttal too. So the original, you know, proponents say that the studies are flawed. I'm not sure about the technical details of, of the study, but I get the argument, and it's one that really troubles me. And so one of the reasons why I'm skeptical, and I hope I made that clear by being on the box. Like for me, it was like, okay, sure. That's, I like the fact that you're not asking right away about a person's criminal record. That doesn't immediately go from application to trash just because of this box. But there's so much more than that. One, people can find out later and then kick you out of the interview stage, right? Um, but what happened there, which is something I hadn't thought of previously, but when I read the, those studies and, and thought about them, basically what it is is the assumption that if somebody comes who stereotypically could have a criminal record, right, which is, of course, people are then thinking in their mind, African American male, particularly somebody without a high school degree. Sadly, this is a little sidebar, but 85% of African-American men without a high school degree wind up in prison at some point in their lives. Right? That's just a horrific statistic that I mention all the time when I'm teaching. I just want people to think about what that is. That's almost a prison sentence in and of itself. Right? Um, but so, um, with Ben the Box, the idea is, well, we don't really know, but let's just assume, so we throw it out. Right? And so, the study show that there's actually more African American men being thrown out with family box in place, a policy that ostensibly is meant to protect them. And so it's very, very troubling. To me, I wouldn't necessarily say, again, because there's a debate about the study, I wouldn't necessarily say, let's just get rid of family box, go back to the way it was before, let's bring the box back. I'm not going to say that. Bring the box back. But we need to go much, much further in terms of the actual protection in terms of employment. As I mentioned, you know, the European example, employers do not have a right to know unless it's directly relevant. Why can't we have that type of system? It exists in other jurisdictions, it works, it's good for employers, it's good for applicants. Again, we have to change our entire mindset and the associated law that go along with it to get to that point. Mark, you said 75%? 85% of African American males without a high school diploma will go to prison at some point, jail or prison, at some point in their lives. It is a horrifying statistic. Uh, just a quick question. It seems to me you might change more than your mindset to do the We keep looking over to Europe, we look to Europe for a whole lot of examples, but one of the things Europe doesn't have is kind of part of the religious work system. So, I mean, when you were running through that list of employers, right. I can make an argument yeah. as I hear every one of those professions on why if I'm an employer and I'm going to face, you know, legal liability for a negligent hiring report, right. I can think of a reason why, oh, I might not want to hire that guy. Uh, I'm just completely exposed to the business that I've sacrificed everything that I can do right. to, no, to be lost because of one bad hiring decision. Uh, now, I agree with you. I mean, I'm completely supportive. I would love to see, well, hopefully, I, I think that a lot of those those barriers are completely ludicrous, but I think looking at the liability side, there's a huge difference between us. Yeah, 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 some states have dealt with that. Uh, I don't know all the details. Maybe. I know yeah, some I think I'm going to be excited about the area. Yeah, yeah. 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 which I think has done. Actually, yeah. yeah. a policy yeah. study coming out that addresses yeah. both the banned box question as well as the question you're posing. Yeah. So one solution states have found, and 20 states have done this, is uh, instituting certificates of rehabilitation. The states vary in how they issue those. But 12 out of those 20 states, with the certificate of rehabilitation, comes a protection against negligent hiring liability. And employers have, in surveys, identified what your concern is as the number one concern 
comparing people with criminal records. Well, what, what about liability? So I think there's two pieces to it. One is providing some protection, which states are starting to do. And the second is also changing, I think what Mark was saying earlier, sort of changing the narrative and thinking about the stigma as being something we need to reduce. Because in studies that they've actually done on how people with criminal records do their jobs, employers who are willing to go out on a limb and hire these individuals find that they are better yes. employees. They're more productive more loyal. and more loyal because this is the person who's taken a chance on them. They're more likely to stay in the job. And um, so people who have taken that chance find it's very beneficial and that they are actually less likely than, than someone from the general population to commit any offense on the job. So, so I think part of it is, is ed education, just knowing that. But I think a huge piece of it is just giving giving that protection, that peace of mind, because that liability is something that's lurking at the back of someone's mind. If, yeah, if you're right, right. folks feel like it's almost the sort of Damocles that's hanging there, you know, otherwise really. be very willing to uh, to do that. I've done a lot, of, right. did a lot of work in in, uh, in federal prisons when I was in the Department of Justice on you know work programs, and they are. They can be the benefits there are enormous, and they're really, really, really want to want to make a difference in their lives. Um, yeah, there are studies that I like, uh, by some Yale law students looking at Ohio specifically, and Ohio is one of the states that issues certificates of rehabilitation with that negligent hiring liability protection, and they found that the certificate made a huge difference in callbacks. Um, and it, it was not statistically significantly different than individuals who had no criminal record at all. So it almost oh, equalized right. their positions. Yeah, it was great. So there's something to be said for this protection. It might actually do it a lot. If anyone else wants to change anything. Go ahead, sir. All right. Um, I was bothered just now because you kept on saying over and over again, you can't understand the reasons for this is out there. And you all know basically this is a cautionary principle for protecting classified as license from uh, you know, all kinds of problems. And it's also a real the ordinary stuff. I, I think every time you suggest you can't think of a reason, I mean, I, I think of the tax endowments. I, I'm certain it was never the case that an argument for tax endowments and campaign endowments was ever done for anything other than protecting the public, better tax service, but the reality was, as we saw when Uber came and disrupted it, is what they really wanted to do was they were protecting the owners of the dashes and preventing competition that has truth in the license. So that's part of my long way around. But if I take it, I don't think it, it, to restrict your issue to just the prison population, I think it's a mistake. And is it the case that the four of you are really uh, secret and kind of open Trump supporters, and you want to back up, you want to drain the swamp? Because what Trump has done in the area where he has been successful a lot, because he just was a man, he didn't have to get the factors, is he has removed the power of government to say who's allowed to do things. He's thrown back at it. It seems to me that the better answer here is that it's what the market says. No, let owners and let the business people decide those who want to take the risk and uh, maybe want to encourage some kind of closure. Well, disclosure, you put up with uh, some, you know, some, some process to deal with the cautionary principle of the increase. Uh, and the last thing is, I think, you know, that a lot of in public housing, it isn't the case that somebody came along and said, you want to restrict this come back to just be haunted. The reason is oftentimes the people living there, they were looking for a way of preventing bad habits from getting in. And that's a simple solution. It's a simple, it's a blood So it can't be right after all the law. But since it's, it's encoded in law, and most encoded in law, it's not possible for the owner of this complex to say, we don't have to deal with that way, but we're just going to say, what is the force for 10 years or 8 years or 6 years or something like that? Because it's involved. They don't have the choice. So, are you trying to respond to people? 
So the Institute for Justice has been litigating for the right of people to earn an honest living for about 27 years now. So before um, any of the current administration was involved in these types of laws. Um, and our argument here is that states and municipalities and the federal government do not have the constitutional authority to engage in economic protectionism and pick winners and losers. Um, occupational licensing is a big part of that, including <coughs> collateral consequences for people with criminal convictions. Um, so it extends across occupations, particularly with tax medallions and things like that. Um, we had some pretty good successes in breaking down some of these barriers, both in the courts, uh, in the legislatures, um, in the court of public opinion as well. And so I think there's a moving trend there to let people work in the occupations that they want to work in and recognizing that this is not a legitimate government interest and a legitimate use of government power. Mark and Marcus, either of you want to chime in? Yeah, you have to have some support. I don't have a response. Still processing that, but I mean, I, you know, your taxi medallion example um, <coughs> suggests maybe there's just something in the occupational licensing boards that um, is about self protection, self preservation, a cabal of sorts that doesn't want uh, other to let people in and wants to have control over who can get in, wants to keep out uh, others. Uh, I don't know. As for the rest of it, I'm not sure what was the question or what was the uh, statement, but um, <laughs> my dream is a person. I think that was the one part of your um, statement that was the question. Uh, one of the power of government, that, I mean, the more efficient you roll it back, the more freedom you will have, and the people, and you can say, well, take a chance on me, and yes, I have a record. If you're allowed to, but if the government says you can't live in public housing, and that's a code of law, or a regulation, or a municipal code, or whatever that, you, the problem the market can't cope with you. So I think that the detail there is that it's quite often not the law and the legislation that says people with records cannot do X, Y, and Z. It's that the law says licensing boards and housing boards and things like that have broad discretion to make those decisions. And so the key there is to say that these bodies do not have the authority to deny a privilege based on these certain characteristics. And with that, I think if you do, I know we have so many questions, but we're just going to move to the reception, actually. And you'll have a chance to ask the panelists those questions there as well. I don't need to cut off discussion. But I also, yes, sorry, go ahead really quick. I need to cut you off. I'm going to answer the great segue. So, sure. my name is Keisha Robinson, and I manage the Prisoner and Reentry Legal Services Program for the DC Public Defender Service. And we actually um, represent and advocate for all the people that you guys are talking about. That broad discretion, we go before the licensing licensure boards. We also represent people with um, uh, arrest records and uh, convictions. So if we know anyone, we can help them. So Thank you so time. much for that pitch. And I just wanted to make one more pitch. Um, if you do have a reception, please join us for that. Um, Marcus, as I mentioned in his introduction, and as you've probably figured out from his t-shirt, uh, is the founder and CEO of Flickshop. And one of the things that happens when we have these kinds of discussions is sometimes people don't know what to do with the information. They, they feel a call to action, but don't really have anywhere to put that. So one thing we wanted to offer you is an opportunity to take a quick picture at the Flickshop photo booth. And I'll let Marcus say just a few more things about what that means or where that's where the picture would go. Yeah, thank you. So uh, really quick, everyone, meet me in the back. We have the Flickshop photo booth. I want you to be able to come over, do one thing. The way that the Flickshop app works is take a picture, you add some quick text, we press send, we take that picture text and print it on a real tangible postcard, we mail it to any person anywhere in the country. This is an opportunity for the community to be able to get involved tonight. This time, you'll be able to come back, take a picture, say, hey, you know what, keep your head up, be encouraged, press send. And what this want to do is, from Archie Institute, we have a select a group of people who are getting ready to come home, and they just want to be able to feel the support and love from the people in this room. I can tell you, when I sat in sales C13, you couldn't have gotten me to believe that there were going to be a group of people like you guys that were convening on the hill that cared about my future. Now, you guys have the opportunity to band with us to be able to say, hey, we do care. Quick pick, quick encouraging words. Our students are already taking care of it. We're going to ship it out to people all around the country to say you care about it.